Jesus say to Philip? Can anybody remember the quote? He says, Philip, you know, Philip had asked him, will you show us the Father? Will you show us what the Father's like, Jesus? And Jesus, I, I can imagine the eyes. If you got a chance, watch The Chosen. I can imagine his eyes looking at Philip, says, Philip, have I been with you so long and you've not known me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, why do you suppose Jesus said that? And why do you suppose it was so important for him to address Philip? Because in the Old Testament, they didn't know a loving Father God. They only knew a mighty, almighty, powerful God, one whom they many feared. There were a few like Abraham and a few people like Moses that got to know God, but still they didn't know him as a father. So when Jesus talked about his father all the time, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me, my father. I've, that which I see my father do, that do I. Isn't that cool? Amen. And so he, he was talking about the father all the time. Finally, Philip spoke up. He says, would you tell us about the father? And Jesus saying, I'm here so you can see me. You can eat with me. You can see how I intermingle with all the people. This is how the Father is. Now, that brings us up to a good question. If you're like me, I want to know. Then why did we see such a harsh Father in the Old Testament? Because he had to protect the fact that the Word was going to come and be flesh and redeem all mankind. Now, what would have happened if Jesus couldn't come? We wouldn't be sitting here. We probably wouldn't be here at all. Amen? So, God the Father had to protect the plan so the Messiah could come. So the people in the Old Testament, because Jesus hadn't died yet and rose again, the people lo loved God. There was many that loved God, and they believed in God, and it was put on their account for righteousness. But no one had God in them. Now, you'll be reading it along in your Old Testament, and I believe you should study it. But you'll see that God was in this and God was in them. But he's talking about what they were doing, not them personally. Now, do you know that as a fact? You should. Because nobody can get born again until Jesus died and rose again. And remember, this is probably more than a lot of Christians know. Now, another one is that nobody could leave the planet until Jesus broke the curse. Hello. He's the firstborn from among the dead. So if there's a first Seth, there's a second. If there's a first Joe, there's a third. And all the rest of us, if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, we become saved. And we are sealed and guaranteed in the resurrection. Can you say amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I don't know what you came to do, but I came to learn the word. <laughs> amen. This is a fun church. and Really, we love to enjoy God. God loves his children to be in his presence. So today, we're going to be talking about understanding our father. Isn't that Cool. Understanding your heavenly father, because most people don't understand where he sits in authority and, and, and such things like what I'm going to just say to you. And this is it. Did you know God, the father never got off his throne? He's always been on his throne. And can you tell me why? Sure, Denise, that's very good. Because if God got off his throne, he wouldn't be God anymore. So. We know God to be, according to scripture, three persons in one. Can you say amen? And he's known as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the beginning, the Bible says in John 1:1, 1, 1, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So if the Word was God, the Word still is. That's right. And we have to treat the Word in our life as God himself. When we reverence God and his word, all heaven opens up. Look at your neighbor and smile and say, God has great things for you. 
God has great things for you. But we need to get to know our Heavenly Father. Many, many people, many Christians today don't understand that God could turn on them at any moment. They think that if they do things wrong or maybe they blew it for the very last time, God was going to leave them. I don't know about you, but, you know, that's a good lie that the enemy uses. God never will leave you nor forsake you. Say, God will never leave me nor forsake me. The only thing, now listen, the only thing you can do if you want, don't want to be saved anymore just give God back to God. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? You can't actually give the gift of salvation back, but who would be foolish enough to do that? You see, and so there's a lot of Christians, Satan plays with their mind, thinking they've lost their salvation. Folks, if God gave you your salvation, then you can't just lose what God has given to you. Hello? You have to give it up, but you can't lose it. It's permanently attached in you and on you. Can you say amen? So we lean, if, uh, maybe you don't, maybe I, but I lean more to God's ability to save me, clean me up, make me into a champion than sin's ability to destroy me. Here's the way I'm thinking at it. I don't play with sin, nor do I recommend a Christian to get anywhere around it. Well, when you make a mistake, it's not going to destroy you from being a child of God. Say amen. If my son accidentally bumps my car and puts a huge dent in it, does he stop being my son? He's just out of fellowship. We need to talk. And that's what happens when you go out and you do something and you feel like maybe you blew it or something happened and it, it, it just something came down. God never leaves you. He's patiently waiting for you to admit, man, God. And he says, great, let's work on it together. See, that's what a father does. Hello? That's what our Heavenly Father New Testament does. That's who Jesus came to represent to us. Have you seen any time, Jesus, oh, maybe once, maybe twice, where Jesus got mad or came against someone unfairly. Never. So if Jesus said, he had has seen my, me, has seen the. Father. Now I'm going to bring you up to something so you have an answer for this. Then the father's really not like that either. Hello? But we see him, Pastor Kerry, in the Old Testament. He's opening up the ground and swallowing people and serpents are coming in. And what's all that about? Go back to the plan. Nobody had God in them. And anyone, now listen, this is a sad thing. Anyone in the Old Testament could have turned on God at any time and sometimes did. And when they did, they were treated as an enemy. You'll notice God hardly ever called them other than the children of Israel. He called them servants. If you read in the New Testament before Jesus died and rose again, they were de declared as a servant. A servant doesn't know what his father's doing, but a son does. Hi, sons and daughters. We're not a servant of the Lord. Yes, we serve the Lord. But we're children of the Lord. Can you say amen? So we came into the New Testament. Jesus died and rose again. And now we accept him as our Lord and Savior. We become a child of God. God dealt with our sin, past, present, and future. And now deals with our attitude. Are you saying, Pastor Kerry, that if I sin, God's just going to wink at it? No. I'm saying when you sin, God's going to deal with you. But as with a son... Or as a daughter and not as a sinner. Can you say amen? Boy, that should make you happy. Why? Because God can never be accused of abusing his children. What if I did? My, what if my son played with matches? And I said, well, I want to teach you a lesson, son. And I turn on the burner of the stove and he says, come on, put your hand over there. What is that called? Child abuse. 
The stuff that people blame God for is nothing more than child abuse. We are in the New Testament. Get the New Testament. Get the new car. Get out of the old Volkswagen Beetle. Especially if it's only running on three cylinders, which happens every four or five months. You got to always tweak those things because they rattle themselves to death. Now let's get into the lesson. Getting to know our Father. Say amen. Our, our scripture be, should be behind me here shortly. It's John 3, 16 and 17. I spoke this years and years and years ago. Everybody really kind of breathed when they got to 17. Love the background, Danny. That's cool. It says, for God so loved, I know you guys know this by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish come to an untimely or violent death. That's the word perish there. But have an everlasting life. Say amen. amen. But everybody forgets this one. All the people are running around judging everybody, condemning people that they don't believe should be believing that. And they're running up this and running down the country and they're doing this. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Amen. Get this. To condemn the world. But that the world through him might be what? Now, folks, what we don't understand is God gave mankind a lot of authority. Now, I'm going to just act out a couple of things. If this man here who's saved, who has a lot of authority, suddenly one day decides I'm going to rail against the devil, rail against my country, what am I doing? I'm railing against the country. What am I doing? I'm opening myself up for satanic attack. Because we're to walk in love. And the Bible says when somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the second cheek. Nobody understands that. Now I want to tell you, the second cheek is where God steps in. It's where you trust God. Somebody might get the first punch in, but if you step back and let God step in, they're not going to get a second. But if you start being aggressive and take matters into your own hands, you see it and you start railing and you start doing that, you're not turning the other cheek. You are entering into the trap. As a man sows, so shall he reap. So if you start bickering and fighting back, you're stepping into Satan's a trap. You just lost. You were just suckered. Somebody might insult you, God forbid, but don't turn around and insult them back. That's where we get suckered. Because if especially the person suckers you is not saved. Why would you as a Christian who is say something rude back? Satan loves that. And he keeps score on you. Someone say, oh me. So if he's keeping score on you, what do I do, Pastor Kerry? What do I do? What do I do, Denise? I say, Father, all my words spoken judgments when I call people a dumb dumb, you know, and I shouldn't. Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. All of those little marks are gone. Amen. Ooh, the slate's clear. That's the thing you have, nobody else has. Forgiveness. They have tradition. We have God forgive me. Isn't that cool? And you know what he does? You're forgiven. The Bible says if we agree with him that we've made a mistake and he sees that we've made a mistake, but we agree, Lord, I made a mistake. Then we're saying the same thing as him. He then releases forgiveness and covers us like we have never done a thing wrong. Hello? And when you get up in the morning and you meet with God and address God and just spend a couple of minutes with him, you're completely washed and clean. You've had your shower in the spirit. You've been clothed and now you're ready to go. Do you get up that way? I get up that way. I don't even bother not getting up that way. I get up. First thing I do is I flip on the coffee, get myself. I have to eat a little something in the morning. Otherwise, I'll sweat and all because of the situation of my sugars but when I do and I get all that set and I sit down you know, we start praying and I pray for Israel pray for our nation I go around I have what I call the outer circle the inner circle and those people that you know are working within the church that needs the extra prayer because when people are leading and doing things in the church Satan hates that the most 
It, it, it's fine if you just come and listen. Don't do anything for what you heard, but just come and listen. But all of a sudden, now you're hostessing. You're starting to do things. Things are changing. By the way, God wants me to tell you, he's very pleased. For he has broken you out of the first chamber of bondage because he told you and you have seen that you are his princess. Now for you, sister, God says great things are coming. But the Lord wants to have you put a guard up because there was a feeling not many days ago of you drawing back and you weren't sure and you're having some doubt. Normal. But God says he's not with those that draw back. He's with those that press on. So God says, press on. Watch my blessings come your way. All right? Amen for both of you. And, and it's because you're seeking God. And what does God have for me? Wonderful things. What is he telling you? Everything I said to them, they already heard, but maybe not sure that they did. Anyway, let's get into this. So good morning, greetings, church family. Not only is this the day the Lord hath made, but he's got great things in the days to come. Two things are going to go on. The, the people that are serving the other guy, they're going to get darker and weirder. You're going to see weird things. Signs in the heavens, signs on the earth, signs on the earth. But for the believer who's focusing on God, you're going to see a great revival. You're going to see people walking up and the power of God so strong, they're going to fall down because the presence of God on you. They're going to, some people are going to say, dear God, man, dear God, woman, I want what you have. You say, well, I don't have anything, but what I do have, I'm going to give you in the name of Jesus Christ and learn to release God. You're going to see people on the street singing about Jesus again. As spring comes this year, you're going to see concerts back in the park. You're going to see all kinds of the power of God moving. But it's going to take the people of God to start seeking God and putting God first. Can you say amen? Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things you have need of shall be added unto you. Seek me me, saith God, and as you learn to seek me, my power will flow down and through you, for I will pour out my spirit in the last days, and it will come out just like power and just like blood, and it will come out, and it will saturate and cleanse the land, and guess who are the ones that I'm going to pour my spirit out of? It is going to be you, saith the Lord, and others like you. Woo! I think you poured a little bit out on me. Yes, they did. Oh. I've seen all of us like pitchers and the flowing cisterns of God were coming out of us like a wellspring, just splashing out on people because we chosen not to promote ourselves or promote what we're doing for God, but, but to promote the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Go with me to John chapter 17, please. Understanding our Father... Again, like I was saying, in the Old Testament, they experienced God, but it was more like a coming and going. How many here remember when Jesus taught about the new piece of cloth on an old garment? Can, raise your hands. Tell me if you remember reading that scripture. If not, read It's a parable. It says, no man puts a new piece of clothing on an old garment because when it gets weathered, the new garment pulls away from the old because they're not compatible. You have to easily wash the old piece, of, the new piece of garment and get it kind of weathered. Then you can put it on the old garment, right? Well, what he was talking about, you can't take God and sow him on your life in the Old Testament. Because after God's assignment, which that little piece of garment is done, will pull away from you because you're unclean, you have sin, you're not born again. So in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would drop on people like Samson or drop on people like David, and they would do mighty acts and mighty works like the prophet who make the axe head swim. It would come down on them, but it wouldn't flow in them. But it, that was a garment that was part of the God's presence on the old garment. You know, the Bible says, take off the old man and put on the new man. So you've got an now as you're being born again, have Jesus in your heart, you have a new garment you wear. The old garment's here. And you'll know if the old garment starts speaking up. How many here have the old garment with you? Everyone's hands you've got. How many here's ever had the old garment speak up? 
Sure you have. I might have said something one day, and you said, I don't believe that. Old garment. <laughs> Old garment. Amen. And I don't know about you, nobody brings the wrong costume to a wedding. Remember that one parable where it says that somebody invited all these people, and then there was somebody there at the wedding that didn't have a wedding garment on? That was a note to the Jewish people. You can't get to heaven just because you're Jewish. You must be born again. You must get the right garment on. Jesus, put on a garment of praise for the Spirit. See, we wear Jesus. Didn't you, did you remember that last week? You wear the robe of righteousness. You wear the armor of light, and you're clothed in Jesus Christ. You wear Jesus Christ. So when you're walking down the road in, in tune with God, the kingdom opens up to you. All the angels, they're submitted to you. You are actually a king's kid, but we don't think that way. We think we're an old piece of dirt. We did something wrong, yelled at the grandkids. Now I'm walking down there in armor somewhere back there. <laughs> it's dim. Only thing you can see is a little candle in the window. That's where a lot of Christians are. They got a little candle in their window. No. Amen. So let's get into this. You got John 17? Let's read this. Okay, so John 17, here we go. Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you as you have given him authority. Listen to this next phrase, over all flesh. See, the Jesus that now lives in you can overcome any of your habits. We'll go into that more often. Uh, can authority over all flesh and he should give eternal life to as many as have given that you have given him. Verse 3. And his... And this is eternal life, that they may know you. See, we're born again now. We know him. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified. Now, this is Jesus talking. I have glorified you on earth. I have. Now, look at the next phrase. I have finished the work. Is Jesus' work done? Not quite yet, but he's going to say one day on the cross, it is what? And then it's finished. This is where we fail. Satan convinced a lot of Christians they have to still get their victories. And the reason why they still have to get their victories because they did something that wasn't so right and messed it up. And they messed that victory up. Now they have to re-get it. Get it? And so don't be running around. You're not going to hear me say, go out there and get your victory. No, I'm teaching you how to always have the victory, maintain the victory, and to keep your life healthy before God. Wouldn't it be better to stay healthy before God than go out and get broken than fixed? Go out there, get broken than fixed? You see, there's divine healing where you get sick and God heals you, and that's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But then there's divine health where you don't get sick hardly at all. That's what you're going for. Lord, I dwell with God so much, he keeps me healthy. Hardly ever get a sniffle, hardly ever get anything. Say, that's me. But see, there's one even higher than that. Divine healing, divine health, and divine life. 30, 60, 100 fold. You have all of that at your accessibility. Your fellowship with God is what makes the difference. It's your soaking God that makes you valuable. Okay? It's not what you do. What you do is important. But if you haven't soaked up enough God, what you do is going to be a lot of you in what you do. Hey, I'm a poet. There's a lot of you in what you do. There are a lot of me be a lot of the Lord. Amen? Instead. All right, so... And he says that, Father, we may be one, okay? 
All right, I have glorified you in the earth. I've finished your work. I have given me what you've given me to do. Oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which we had before the world was. So we know Jesus was with the Father at the beginning. Can you say amen? All right, four things we're going to cover today. Look at somebody and say, four. What was that commercial? It says four. You know, when it went down finally to four. Okay, first thing we're going to cover is, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. We're going to talk about what Jesus has actually said to Philip and what he's actually saying to you. Many Christians today think they know God, and they are going after it. But it's not until you, by revelation, has been with God that you actually begin to see God the way he really is. Hello? Let me just see a show of hands. How many here thought when you first got saved, God, you're hoping God, you know, favorable, you didn't know if he was going to get you or not get you? Come on, raise your hand. Kind of nod at me, yeah? Lots of you, lots of you. So the idea behind all of that is the impression that the world gives us and religious people give us may not be the gospel. That's why it takes a while for us to get to know. See, I already love you, and I know you already appreciate me, but it takes a while for us to get to know one another. And if you're having a friendship, you know, or you want, you know, even my father, I had a wonderful father. But it took me a while to get to know him where I could relax around him and know him as my friend. And see, in the Old Testament, people couldn't relax around the even thought of being next to God. Ooh! You know, because they realized what they had done in the beginning. But you see, Jesus came to show us we have a father. All right. So his message to us is this. If we perceive God through Christ, we will see the father. Now, my pastor taught me, he says, you can't just take everybody's preaching of the word for face value. And he says, certainly you can't take the emotions of the preaching of the word to stir you up. You must take the word, come to me with it, and I breathe the fire in you. So he says, you're going to hear a lot of good preaching and a lot of good teaching. And I says, well, how do I know the, the difference? He says, line all preaching and teaching up through Jesus Christ in his actions, how he spoke. So Jesus becomes our eyepiece. If Jesus didn't say it, there must be some other truth about what we think is the truth. Huh? So we look at the word of God through the word of God, Jesus Christ. He becomes our spectacles, our eyeglasses. And without them on, you're going to get an opinion about the word. You, you're going to make up and an opinion. Here's one. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Now, is that true? Yes, it's true. Depends on how you're looking at it. Truly, the way, way you heard it, it, it's not true. God does not take away things from you unless it's your sin. So the only way that would be true is God took your sin away from you and gave us his life. That would work, see? All right, but the Lord giveth and taketh away. He doesn't take away what he gives you. So if he made you a female, he's not going to make you a male. See, I got that one. Amen. If he gave you the gift to gab, maybe he needs to take that one away. No, anyway, but there are gifts that he gives you that will remain in you and some may never develop. Do you understand? You have muscles and, and tissues that, that, that it's not until you do something different. I remember when I went out and played darts for the first time. Remember that, dear? Went out and played darts, you know, not drinking in the bar or anything. But we played darts for the first time. Played about 10 games. Oh, the next day, my shoulder felt like somebody pounded on my shoulder for an hour. Just by going like this. You see? So... We have spiritual muscles and spiritual things in us 
that God wants to, us to come to that he will open our eyes to so we can begin to step through those. And as we get to a muscle and we begin to exercise the muscle, the muscle gets toned and gets developed. Say amen. You have a muscle in you. His name is God. And the reason why we look out and see a lot of Christians that act and drink and cuss and do all that is they've never exercised the God in them. Nobody said amen. I'm not talking about you. It's the, what happens. They never go to God for God to... See, you don't grow by what you do. You grow by who you see. God is the sun. Sun develops the seed. Hello? You need a little rain, Holy Spirit. You need a little earth. Some nice, um, what is it? Nutrients. And the seed will grow. But some people will never take themselves to church to get the good ground and nutrients. So we get our nutrients from everyone. Everyone talking about God. Everyone doing the God thing. You see? And then we also get the son by meeting with God. Can you say amen? And as we meet with him, we get our armor on, we walk through life. He continually washes us with his water. But see what happens, Satan knows it right away. He says, ah, I can distract him. Watch this. Say something to you immediately. You're off of God and onto what you're thinking. And see, that's what we inherited from Adam. A spasmatic thinking and unmovement. Stop that. Stop. <laughs> and, so, and that's how some people are in the body of Christ. That only God can take that out of us and make us work together for good. It would be awful. We were on a cruise and everybody was taking an oar from all the lifeboats and beating each other with it. They say, give me, show me the captain. Well, mutiny. All right. Well, that's where half the church has been for 20 years. Beating each other and rebelling, leaving from church to church, hoping to find their niche. No, seek God and he'll make a niche for you. Guarantee. Here's the example. I told God I was done. I'd just go serve. God says, no, you're not. How many has ever argued with God? Don't raise your hand. I said, God, I'm done because, look, I, I failed and I did a lot of these things and nobody in their mind's going to really have faith in me anymore. So let me go serve. So I, I served in a whole bunch of churches, didn't we, dear? Yep. And got them going and did their usher training, baptized the people. I baptized a whole lot of people out of Foursquare. I got their baptism class and their ushers training going there and their personal work and going. Because all that, I was trained when I was, you know, coming up and being in the ministry. I didn't want to go to waste. You never want what God has taught you to go to waste. You might have blown it or you may, might. And at this time, I felt terrible. My mom died. My dad died. I, I could go on and on and on. And I'm sitting around losing my feet. And God says, I'm not done with you. <laughs> Good. Would you wake up my psyche? Slap me around the head? You know, God's not done with this until we breathe our last breath. If you're a kind of less in mobility, you can pray. You can go all over the world in prayer. If you choose to become a friend with God, he'll take you even in some journeys. Think about John G. Lake. He was taken to Africa in the spirit. Anyway, that's a whole lot to share. So let's get back. So literally what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth today is revealing the Son and the Father to you. Hello. We know kind of about Jesus because we can read him in the scripture. But then the, how many has ever had the Holy Spirit reveal something to you? Isn't that exciting? But the Holy Spirit was there when the scripture was written, wasn't he? He inspired the scripture being written. He was there. In, and you know, when I, when, I, when I read something in the Bible, I say, Father, in Jesus' name, take me there. Take me there. And I've had the Holy Spirit in, in only in pictures take me to the pool of Bethesda and I could hear the water. 
the people in the background kind of mimmering and mourning, and the guy's uh, and this guy laying in his bed. And then Jesus walking up to him. Now, there is a clip from the chosen like that. But when I studied something like that, way before I heard of the chosen or watched anything on a video, the Holy Spirit would take me there. I could smell the smells. And he would take you in the spirit. Remember, this is the one, the body is the one that is hinder us. But God doesn't leave us there. We go to him. I say, Lord, help me to get into the scripture. Then he takes us up into the higher realm. And we can smell smells. We can hear sounds. We can see vision. This is where God wants you to study your Bible. That's why you need some time with you and God alone to study scripture too. Not just have a face to face. That means looking at his face and he looking at your face. But also pray and ask God to open the spiritual eyes of your understanding. There have been, when I was studying, you know, I was just studying and talking to God about how things are. When he revealed to me about him being in the boat and not being in the boat how that was Old Testament and New Testament. I went, wow, God, I never saw, I read the Bible so many times. I never saw that before. He says, you'll never see a lot of things if you don't get the eyes of your understanding, get it enlightened. And so what you need to know is that studying about Jesus, having the Holy Spirit help us study about Jesus will get us to open up to our Father. Amen. People still today, Christians, Oh, Father, I pray this. I pray this. Lord, I come to you, Jesus. And they talk to Jesus like he's the Father. He's not the Father. Because Jesus would have never talked a lot about another person called his Father. You see, he wants us to address the Father now. Because we're pleased in the Son. I mean, if your brother, I mean, he's God. Jesus is God. Always was God. Always will be God. But if somehow he encourages you to get to know the Father like him. Oh, you're going to please the Father. And there is nothing more exciting and more blessed than pleasing your Heavenly Father. You already please Jesus. You already please the Holy Spirit. Unless you become a jerk and then you'll grieve him. But you already please all that. But to please the Father, every time you please the Father by lifting up his Son, by glorifying his Son, by doing what the Bible says... The Father shares and rains down his presence. Man, I don't know about you, but I like to be scooped up one day and taken somewhere. Anybody here for game? You know, you're walking down the road saying, Lord, I just appreciate you and everything like that. And suddenly somebody pulls up and says, God sent me. <laughs> to nowadays, you wouldn't know to get in or not, you know. And okay, all right, you're getting close, you know. It's okay. I believe in Jesus. You get in. Next thing you know, the car just goes up. It doesn't go out. It doesn't turn around. It just goes. And you're right in the throne room. I love it. I have imagination. I should do a couple of children's books. And there you are in front of the throne. God says, you've been lifting up my son, Seth, so much. What is it you need? What do you want? Uh, uh, uh. Now we get tongue-tied because I don't know. You can't really get in the. I don't know if you're like me. I when I can't really when the presence of God is really strong on me, I can't say much of anything. It's more like you look at me. If you ever could see me that way, don't. If you see me that way in the store, leave me alone. All right. So you get it. If we have seen Christ, we focus on Christ. We. We read about Christ. We start to, the Father suddenly is going to come alive to us. Folks, I'm convinced nowadays that many Christians, even though they need to be fathered, haven't opened up enough for the Father to father them. Hello. I don't know why. I had a pretty decent father, but not like our Heavenly Father. He's more than decent. And remember, He's not going to be busy with Sherry and forget about Seth. He's not going to be busy with BJ and forget Joe or Diane or Becky or any of the others. Hello? He's personal to each of you. So 
he'll never be distant to you unless you make him distant and then complain about it. Oh, Lord, you seem so distant. God says, I got a sense of humor. That's because you haven't talked to me in a month. <laughs> and I don't want to watch your flesh all day, son. Open up. Here, man, let's go on. All right, point two. We are adopted children by our Heavenly Father. Now, what you don't know about adoption, according to the law, when you were adopted, you were treated more special than the child himself. Now, I'm talking about in the Jewish time, okay? So if they adopted a child, that means that they, that child was in terrible condition. They adopted like one of their own, and they would favor that child because it was so abused coming from a different family, okay? They wouldn't show favoritism, but they would favor that. Let me give you a New Testament scripture. Those parts in the body that lack God puts more favor on them. Those needing grace, you can ask for more grace. That's not making God a respecter of persons. That's just making God who God is. If you have a child, a child that's challenged, don't you treat that child with a little loving and a little more care? Yes, you do. Because you don't want to crush them. How much more do you think your heavenly father would do that? So guess what? I have a, I have a child, and she's blessed, and she's challenged. I went to God about it. I says, Lord, I'd love to see her healed. And God says, ask. So I asked, and then, you know, I kept asking and asking, and God says, listen, a person has to want to be healed. They have to ask me to be healed. You can't ask for them, especially if they're your own spouse. I said, well, well with Becky, I know she's going to be healed when she gets home. We'll just go ahead. And, and God says, not only is she going to be, but I have a better place than you, son, because she can't do anything wrong because of her condition, even though she does. You, you know better. <laughs> So guess what? Some of those people who are challenged are better off than you are. And God, that's God giving them the favor that they need to be complete and favored here and then completely favored there. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you get a chance. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, how God takes the foolish things, the weak things, and all of these things to confound the world. Can you say amen? Hey, God uses all kinds. I mean, he's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? I mean, just look at me. <laughs> and look at you. <laughs> all right, so let's go to point two. We are adopted children. Let's go to Romans 8, chapter 8, please. Because we are adopted in Christ... We're favored more. Now, God has two entities he looks at in the earth. Now, I believe, and you believe too, that he recognized Germans and Polish people and this and those nationalities. But there's only two in the Bible he recognized, and those are the Jews and the Gentiles. Hello? Notice that? Jews and Gentiles. So the Jews were called out of the Gentiles to make a nation so he could bring forth the Messiah out of them. So Abraham, was when he was saved and believed in God, when God talked to him, was he a Jew or a Gentile? That's right, Sherry, he was a Gentile. There were no Jews. Jews only came 30 years later when Abraham received the covenant and cut his flesh and the Jewish nation was born Abraham, Isaac, Jacob hello Jacob's children, Joseph hello on and on the Jewish nation so God took the nation of Israel out of the world what did he do with you? he took you out of the world and put you in his 
spiritual nation. It's called the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You're a citizen of the kingdom. Can you say amen? <clears throat> so Romans 8, look at verse 12. I got to have some water here. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh, to live according to the natural man or to the flesh. But if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's pretty simple, isn't it? It's saying if you never get saved, you never get born again, you're going to die. Now, let's get beyond that. Okay. It says you will die. And if by the spirit you put to death the things that you do from the flesh, your deeds of the body, you will live. Hello. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The word sons is weos. It means immature. The moment you let God take over your life, you went from an infant to a mature person. Is God stupid? Is God absolutely perfect? So when you totally yield to God, you move into maturity at that moment. Hello? You might move out of maturity after that job is done, back into who you are. But when you're under the obligation and under the authorship of Jesus, you're mature. Because it isn't you making the decisions. Who's making the decisions? God. Is he immature? No, so the scripture says when you learn to be led by the spirit, you become mature because you're not operating in your wisdom. You're operating in God's wisdom. You're not operating in your strength. You're operating in God's strength. You're not operating in your thinking. You're operating in heavenly mindedness. Amen. And that's why we go to God and we learn to yield to God. And why? So he can take over control of our life and guidance of our life. Because once God is starting to steer your car, you're not going to have an accident. We have plenty of them. And we go, God, why did you allow this to happen? God says, you took over the controls. You hit the clutch instead of the brake. What am I saying to you? I'm saying when we think we know what God wants and then we go and step ahead of him and start doing what God we think God wants, you've already missed it. It isn't do it because we know God wants us to do it so much as God's inspiring us to do it and it's him working with us in doing it. So when Jesus says somebody asks you for your cloak, what did Jesus say? Go, and, you know, give them your undergarments too. So if somebody asks you to get involved in a work in the church, don't just do a job. Do it with excellence. Because God is watching you and working with you. And I've never seen such a sloppy God. I'm not talking about you. Notice I didn't say that. You guys are wonderful. But when we do something for God, it should be done as excellent as we can. And whatever we fall short in, God makes up the difference. Say amen, somebody. So don't just do what barely is to get along. Because that's all your Christianity will become. A barely get alonger. No, do it excellent. Say, God, teach me how to do it excellent. Daniel was noted in the country and got the country out of a seven year, 70 year bondage because he had an excellent spirit and leadership. So can you. Family in bondage, you can lead them out. Your neighborhood, maybe you're on some kind of club or something, you can lead them out. You are to be the leader, not a follower, unless it's Jesus, of course. Are you with me? So therefore, we are not debtors to our flesh according to the flesh. Because if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the spirit, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. Get to know your father. Abba is an enduring term. It's like calling my wife sweetie cakes. 
but with respect. Abba means dad. You know, I, I, my father was a good man. And he was a dad. But he also had a fatherness. In other words, if I did something wrong, the fatherness come out. And when I did something right, like, Dad, I don't need anything. I just want to tell you I love you. The daddiness came out. God says we've been adopted totally. So you're not filthy to God anymore. You are accepted in Jesus. So not only know your father as someone who's in charge, but someone you go to to be a dad. Do you understand me? To let him father you. Because he's gentle and he's merciful and he listens and he knows how to fix us if we just open our heart and go right in and massage our heart, massage our soul and heal us. If we, the thing is, we, a lot of times when we go before God, we're not as relaxed. I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying sometimes we don't relax at all. We just get all uptight because he's God. No, God wants us to relax, to learn to soak like you're in a hot tub. To learn to open up and let God begin to fix and, and become the f dad. Some of us didn't have a good dad. Okay, I'm saying us. Some of us didn't have a good mom. I happen to have a fairly good dad and mom. I was fortunate. But I know there's a lot. And there, you look at the children who had no dad. The conditions of the broken family. Hello? I know Scott had good parents. And when where there, a child is being brought out where there's no father figure, there's no clear mother figure, the children are always ruined. It's just a fact. There's no standard. Folks, Church of Jesus Christ, we're children. And you're going to see with your own eyes, and I'm sad to say, many of those children are disobedient. They're going whatever they're doing and doing whatever they want to do. It's like they have no father. Exactly. Did you know the Bible says if you won't let God be your father, then you are without a father. Well, that makes sense, Pastor. I didn't say it. The Bible says that if you won't get under the father's care, then you are bastards, illegitimate children. You have no parents. And there are Christians running around doing this and doing that when they want to. And you're out of control. You're not letting the father father you. Now, that's the stern part. The great blessings that come for just surrendering. See, every day I say, God, I surrender. Why would you need to surrender, Pastor Kerry? Because there might have been something that happens in my flesh. So I surrender, making sure he knows I'm not going to rise up and get an attitude. So I just simply say, Father, I surrender. Do you guys know what the prayer of renunciation sounds like? Lord, I renounce this in my life. In Jesus' name. I renounce. Not, I think this. No, I renounce this in my life. Lord, I noticed the other day I got frustrated. Lord, I renounce that in my life. When you do that, he brings up the healing. So that becomes less and less of an issue. Say Amen. And he says, listen, the spirit himself bears witness in our spirit that we are children of God. Say amen. amen. And if we're children, then we are heirs. And then if we're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And if deed we suffer with him, we'll be glorified together. Folks, people are not going to like you because you love Jesus. They, they don't like themselves. So if a person doesn't like themselves, how are they going to like you who love Jesus? You are at the epitome of their broken life. So don't get mad at people who get frustrated at you because you're so full of God. Don't get hurt. Don't do any of those things. That's all in the natural plane. You see, when I'm sharing Jesus with somebody, I don't look at their face or the, other than to locate how they're receiving. I talk to their heart. Somebody else said, hey, can I share a little bit about salvation? Oh, you mean tell me about religion? I says, no, I want to tell you about the one who, who gave the cure for the most ungodly disease. 
You know the disease in Africa? I would go on and say, yeah, I says, like, you know, and I mentioned a few of them. I says, there needs to be a cure. And he'll say, yes. I says, we all have a disease worse than that. We do? Sin. And the only cure for that is what I want to give you right now. Would you like that? Yeah. See, if you present God properly, they'll accept most 80% of the time. But if we come on like they don't know anything or we talk down to them or we talk like they don't know or that, they can pick up on that. Talk to them. Wow, wow, did you, man, I just heard the most fantastic thing. Share Jesus that way. Really? Let me tell you, I was touched supernaturally. Would you like to hear about it? I mean, pull them in. Just don't lie to them. Hello, there was this guy on the side of the road in Bonnie Lake. He had his helmet off. He was on a bike. And God said, pull over. I pulled over behind him. I said, what's the man? He said, I got this splitting headache. And he says, if I pray for you and your headache leaves, would you accept God? So I accept God or anything at this time. Look for opportunities. So I said, well, is let me, dump, let me put my hand on your shoulder and on your other side of your head, okay? And as soon as I touched him, boom, it left. I didn't even get a chance to speak the name of Jesus. God wanted to heal that guy. Why? He wanted to plant a seed in him. Look for opportunities to plant seeds. Are you sniffling? <laughs> Come on now. Because you're adopted in the family, you are treated as if you are Jesus himself. So don't bring up before God how stupid you are. That's evident. <laughs> no. We're like Jesus, so we're accepted like that. And not only that, if you're lacking anything, God will make up the difference because of your background. So if your background was tremendously hurtful, God will make that difference up. You just keep seeking him. Because he says he will heal with the canker worm and with the caterpillar as stolen away in our life. Those are two demons that eat away our life and make us just dry up as an old person and die. Okay? And they steal, kill, and destroy. And you'll find that phrase in the book of Joel. That God will restore what the caterpillar and what the canker worm has destroyed in the lives of people through sin. Wow, I'm looking forward to that. Let's go to our third point. Amen. Our third point is what? Get out your notes. We must be fathered and trained. Now, I don't know about me. Some people, it's hard because their father left when they were a child. Maybe they don't know their father. Or maybe they have a multiple that. Don't, that's the past. Let all that go. Jesus knows how to fix all that. Say amen. But to be a Christian and to be doing your own natural thing in the name of God without letting the father guide you and help you and change you is being fatherless and you're illegitimate and you're only getting a tad of the blessings that God has for you. Because you won't submit to the Father. Let's learn how to submit to the Father, shall we? Would you take your Bible and go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12? We're going to pick up at verse 3. We must be fathered and trained. Hello. I don't know about you. I know but this is just funny. I was listening, I forget I was who I was listening to about potty training. How moms and dads, some of them haven't got a clue. They'll send their kid off and an extra pair of pants and diaper <coughs> and a mental shock. You know, who knows? You know, but we need to be fathered and we need to be trained. Can you say amen? And the world, not going to train us real good. Now, if you might have a good brother or sister, they might be able to speak some good stuff into your life. I had a sister who really hated me because she had to baptize me all, I mean, babysit me all the time. Man, that was something. 
That's why I hated mac and cheese. Because when I'd get out of hand, guess what was waiting for me? I'm hungry. We played all day. I'm sweaty. She gives me some Hawaiian punch, some mac and cheese. Well, the Hawaiian punch is soap. And the mac and cheese, I don't know what's in it. So I pound down the soap because I think it's Hawaiian punch. And it was dish soap. And guess who ran all week? But anyway, so I chased her down the hall and then I let it out. As soon as it was down, it was back up and I just chased her down and let her have it. And I wouldn't, I vowed to never eat mac and cheese again, but I did eat it for the ladies meeting, some wonderful mac and cheese with some lobster in it. Maybe you should be coming to the ladies meetings on Friday. Anyway, so let's look at this. So we must be fathers. So you got Hebrews 12. Look at verse 3. For consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Don't become weary, because Jesus went through it all for you. Can you say amen? And be discouraged in your soul. You have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin you're still fighting against the one who tries to get you to sin and you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you on as to sons now let me bring you up to speed he's talking to hebrew christians who have just freaked out a guy named nero just took over rome and he's killing all the jews and all the christians with the Jewish people, they're not born again. They're just beginning to learn about Jesus. And so they're freaked out and they're spread out everywhere. So now Paul is hiding his name and he's writing to the Hebrews, not saying I'm Paul, the apostle, but he's underhandedly ghostwriting to them. And he says, look, don't panic. And then he gives them some instruction. Stop reacting Stop doing this, and look what he says. He said some unusual things about how to be fathered. Are you still with me? Okay. And he says, you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you, all the things that we've taught you. My son, do not spice the teaching or correction of the Lord. And don't be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. How does God rebuke us? Opens up the earth and swallows you. When God rebukes me, you know how he rebukes me? He says, Carrie, what are you doing? It doesn't sound like much of a rebuke. See, uh, words, look up the meaning of the word. The word chastisement simply means child training. It doesn't mean beat with a stick, okay? And to be rebuked doesn't mean, oh, I rebuke you, I hate you, go stand in the corner. It means that, hey, you're really wrong on this. That's how God rebukes in the New Testament. You're really wrong. You'll feel it. Oh, God, I'm sorry. All right, let's get going. That's how quickly God forgives you. All right, let's get going. He doesn't want us sitting around trying to wonder why we did that. That's just as stupid as doing it. Say, oh, me. Oh, me. Why, oh, why? How come I'm come? Why, oh, why? Me, 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 me. You focus on me. You focus on me. No. <laughs> You're supposed to be dead. Can I have an amen? Don't despise when your father corrects you, okay, or re you are rebuked by him. Hello? For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Old English word, he trains. Listen, if God hasn't spoken to you for a while, I'd wonder how your love walk is doing. No, he loves you anyway. Hello? But you know, people say to me, I, I've never heard God's voice. Or they'll say, I, I don't hear God. And my, my answer to them is, is, the reason is there's too much of you living your life and not enough of surrendering you to the one who gives you your life. Say, oh, me, somebody. Amen. 
So we must be fathered, we must be trained. And it goes on, verse 7, it says, If you endure chastening, chastening, God deals with you as with sons. So you, you're part of the family. For what son is there whom the father does not correct or chasten? If you are without, now listen carefully, if you are without chastening, if which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You're just servants. You haven't been adopted yet. If you don't know God and you're running around freaked out all the time and everything, you're not being fathered. You haven't entered into the family. H hello. How many know that every child, every, every girl, every boy has have some mother and some father somewhere or did? And even if they might be in some kind of uh, uh, home or something like that for the waywards, whatever, they still have a mother and they still have a father or they did. Can you say Amen. But the problem is they're not being mothered and they're not being fathered. But God makes up for that if we surrender him. He becomes our father. And boy, there's never a greater father than him. Can you say amen? So he goes on. And it says, but if you are without chastisement, you all become partakers of, then how? You're not, a, you're not real sons. You're illegitimate. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who have corrected us, and we paid them respect. Respect. There's the key. Respect. Shall we not much more be ready to be in subjection to the Father of the spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days be chastened us after it seemed right to them, but he for our profit. So God, when he corrects us, is for what reason? Our profit. To make us better. Not make us feel bad for doing it. Some people only repent because they got caught. Sad. Don't you know God loves us? Amen. Listen to this last part. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. But painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been exercise or train by it so we need a father and a trainer can you say amen? amen my father didn't just tell me don't go out in the street you get hit by a car he would show us what cars can do and 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 train us another thing with my children and i believe some are watching today okay i didn't take tell my kids go in there and brush your teeth First time I took them in and I showed them how to brush their teeth. Took them by the hand, put it in their mouth, showed them how to move it all about, you know. Hello. We need to be shown how to do things, not just told to do things. How many here got it, got it all down? You got life down, all down. You don't need to be shown another thing. You all got it down. You start living that way, you're full of pride and you will have less and less of God and more and more of you. Pretty soon, you outwear your friendship with everybody because nobody likes us, they like the God in us. Amen. Nobody really likes us. This helps me. They like the God in us. Hello. Ladies, if you think Seth's attractive, and he is, it's because of the God in him. Sorry, Seth. You can get me later. Sorry. Well, it is. The most attractive thing in a woman, in a man, is God in us. Jesus was not a very attractive man, yet people stuck on him like glue. I mean, read it. It says he was uncommonly. He wasn't a common, good-looking man. He might be now. <laughs> We'll see. <clears throat> now, when I saw him, he was beautiful, but it was the radiance of God coming off of him. I had a vision of him when I was very young and in front of 30 other people who saw him too. And he stood before me and he called me to the ministry. And at that time, I didn't have a clue what all that was about. Had to be taught that later on. But you know what? There's nothing stopping God from doing that with you because you are his child. All right, are you with me? 
So we need, must be father, must be trained, because if we're not fathered, we're going to grow up as a lopsided Christians. I see them all the time. They, they can't stay at any church. They've always got a word for everybody, and it's usually wrong. You see, if I don't spend my time with, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Thank you, God, for that. If, let's say I have a baseball team, and they're really good. But they're not spectacular. But they work with each other. They know each other's plays. They know how each other throws the ball. They know who's good at hitting, who's not. The coach has really done his stuff. Right? But the, the main guy, the owner of the team, says, Hey, I got this guy from New York. I'm going to bring him over. and You put him in as the head pitcher. But, but he's not trained with us. He's not got used to us. He's not... He's not got it. He doesn't know the problem. You do what I tell you, you're going to be out of here. So he did. He brings a guy in. The guy can't work to anybody. He's full of pride. He's a ball hog. He thinks he's the key. The rest of the players are rebelling because this guy has not sat down and paid the price of learning to love and care for the teammates he plays with. How many times does the Christian church do that? We'll bring some hot shot in and make him the youth pastor and he'll destroy the church. Because he doesn't know the vision, doesn't know what's going on, doesn't understand the people. You see, we're churching with some wonderful people. How well do you know? How well do you know my sister here? She's new. Find out about her, what she can pray with her about. Amen. Amen. It's all a part of the team. Amen. Amen. And together we win, right? But we bring some hot shot in, like you think I'm just trying to be a hot shot. It isn't going to work. I consider myself lesser than you, so I preach up to you. Now, you might get bashed a couple of times by things I say, but it isn't my intent to, to discourage you in the least bit, but to encourage you. So let's look at our last scripture here. Amen. Our last point, besides being trained and fathered, is the love of the Father to us, we need to understand it. God so loved the what? That he gave his only son. begotten son. That means the word was begotten in the earth. So there was no baby Jesus until the word became flesh. Can you say amen? There wasn't a, a, a son of God in heaven. He was called the word or just the second person of the Godhead. And it, no problem. It's, it's easy to say. Yes, Father Jesus. You know, it's okay. And we don't, we're not legalistic about that. But he didn't become the begotten son until he was born in the earth. Just so you know it. I didn't know that until 13 years as being a Christian. I thought he always was the son of God. No. He was the word. Always was God. But he decided to become a son of God and a son of man. Woo! What a surrender. Who being in the likeness of God thought it not even be to be considered to be equal with God and made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant and he humbled himself. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. All right, go with me to Luke. Yes. I think it says 15, right? <coughs> yeah. All right. I'm excited. Are you guys excited? One thing about the word. When you hear the word, what happens? Faith comes by. So even if you might not understand it all, you're still getting your faith built up. All right, let's look at this story. Let me give you the characters. There's a loving father, very wealthy. He has two sons. One is a religious son. And one is a non-religious son. Both of them are sons. Are you with me? Okay. What's going to happen? Because I don't know. I want to cut our time. The non-religious son, the Gentile son, the youngest of them, knows he had inheritance. In the Jewish faith, the inheritance is chosen when you have your bar mitzvah at 12. So he knew he had an inheritance and he could get it at any time. So he reached a certain age and he says, hey, father, could you give me what's mine? And so the story goes that he got his inheritance and he went to party. Hey, man, he went down to San Francisco. He went to Olympia. 
and he began to party and spend all that he had. And that must have been a lot. And as he partied and spent all he had, finally, there was a famine in the land, and there was no food. So he began to look for work, couldn't find any. He ends up in a barn eating pig food, shucks of the corn and the slop. And then it says he came to himself. You see, we can't get any help until we admit we need some. He came to himself and he says, how much of my father's servants have plenty to eat? And I being his son have nothing. I know what I'll do. I'll go, I'll go and humble myself and be as one of my father's servants. Now, if you didn't understand what I'm about to tell you, now you will. Jews were never children of God. They were servants of God. They didn't know a loving father. They only knew the strict law. You do this or else. Now, you got to get this understanding. I'm not picking on them. I'm just trying to give you an understanding. So, the father's not that way at all. So, when the, when the, the child who was Jewish came to himself, came and, and towards, I'll just come home. It says the father saw him afar off. And then it says the father ran to him. How does God treat people who have fallen away and want to come back? He runs to us. He wants us back so bad. But oh, what's the church doing? We're condemned. Pastor Kerry, you made a mistake. Don't ever pastor again. It's like telling your child, you fell over and knocked my coffee over. Don't ever try to walk again. The church is not in any condition to tell people what to do. We're here to share what they can do. Pray for them so they can do it. And introduce them to God if they don't know him. But it's not to judge one another, not to condemn one another. I went to churches to get restored, and no one would have anything to do with me. And yet I started most of those churches with them. I had to go to California where nobody knew me. Thank God I listened to the Lord. And they restored me like I was a sinner. I didn't bring up all my past. It's not necessary. And I said, I, you know, I failed. I did this. And I wanted to just get into service again. They accepted me, loved me, and then told me about my father. One guy, bless his heart, I should have slapped him. He gave me the book of Job and says, read it. You'll learn why you're suffering. Book of Job is not about suffering. It's about what not to say in the presence of God and what not to believe. Because once he got that right, he got two fold back, didn't he? In nine months of his life. So you know the story. So he comes back and the father sees him. He runs to him and he says, hey, my son, which was dead, is now alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. He says, let's. Get a robe and put it around him. Let's get a ring and put it on. You see, a ring is symbolizes family ownership. Back then, when you had a ring to symbolize your family, they had rings that have their family name on them. Get a ring on his finger. He probably hawked it. Get some sandals on his feet. He'd been walking around in pig manure. And the father's hugging him and just loving him. He put a robe on him. He got a ring on his finger. You're my son. You're my son. And he, and, and he says, kill the fatted calf. The fatted calf is what you wait once a year to taste the filet mignon, you know, the steaks from the fatted calf. And to kill it early means that you're celebrating something very, very good. Your father was willing to run to you and, and see that he clothe you and care for you. Can you say amen? And to put a robe on you. When we go to meet with God, our Father, in Jesus' name, he takes off our old robes and he puts on us the robes of righteousness. You might not see it, but he puts a ring on our finger, symbol of ownership. It might not be a ring, but it's actually a symbol in our spirit that he owns us. If you said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin and come into my heart, you are born again. Believe that you are born again and you are, have a seal on you of ownership. 
It says that the whole of heaven rejoices over one sinner that returns to the Lord. Now, folks, what's happening now and in this day and age, and we're going to break it off here, what happened to his brother? What did his brother, how did his brother treat him? Well, the young guy came home and they're having a party for him. What did the other brother say? I'm not going to have anything to do with this. He went out and he spoiled all this and he did this and he did this and did this. See the attitude of the other brother? That was the Jewish brother. Jews judge, they put people in bondage. He wouldn't have any celebrating to do with it. And that's why the Jewish people missed Jesus when he walked in on the scene. Because Jesus didn't fit any of the religious descriptions of him. He didn't wear robes. He didn't have his hair curled. He didn't wear phylacteries. He didn't do all of the things. Walk around the streets, make big prayers. Nothing that the religious people did. He fulfilled all righteousness. Amen. Well, your heavenly father only wants you to be just honest with him. He wants you to realize that he's right there for you every time. You're never going to do anything that's going to push him away because he lives in you. Now he wants you to relax and to begin to ask him and let him become a father to you. How many here are willing to let God to be your father? Put your hands up. All right, then let's pray this prayer together. Those of you in camera or watching later, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to be a father to me. I love your son, Jesus. He is my Lord and Savior. Not only do you live inside of me, but you watch over me. Now I'm asking you to father me and be my father like never before. And teach me how to watch for it. Teach me how to live in it. And teach me how to enjoy your presence. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a big hand clap, will you?